Hi, welcome to Human Tech, a podcast about the intersection of humans and technology. We have a nice special uh, podcast today with a very special guest. But first, I'd like to introduce Susan. Hello. Hello. And then also with us today is Tim Wilson. Hi, Tim. Hey. So Tim is the Cheryl J. Aston Professor of Psychology at the University of Virginia, and we're really happy to have him on today. Great to be here. Um, before we start, I just want to say again uh, that if you're new to the podcast, you should listen to the old podcasts. Not that they're in order, but just because they're fun. You should uh, tell your friends, subscribe to various things, and you can find out lots of information about us at dteamw.com. And if you have any suggestions for future uh, podcasts or questions or comments, uh, feel free to email us at info at the teamw.com. So um, uh, the, the fun little part of today is that uh, Susan and Tim have been scheming behind my back while I was doing audio checks. We, de- we, we weren't scheming. Scheming to determine the, <laughs> uh, the the topic of the day, and I am completely in the dark. They said yeah, they were well, going to keep it know, a surprise. I think Tim is completely in the dark, too. Uh, we, oh, okay. We, we so, it's co- just, right. so it's just you. It's just me. I'm the only one that knows. No. Let, I, I want to start because I was just telling Tim before we, we – um, before we started recording, uh, I was telling him a little bit about our business, and I had just gotten to the part that actually involves him, and he doesn't know it. Hmm. So I was saying that, uh, um, you know, for many years we did consulting work in usability and user experience, and basically applying, you know, psychology and behavioral science to the design of technology products, software and websites, and that kind of thing. And then what happened was I read one of his books and that took me and my business on a totally different trajectory. And Tim doesn't know that. And Guthrie, I don't know if you know that. Uh, I I am also in the dark. (laughs) So here's what happened. So I was, um, the year was probably about 2007, 2008, probably right um, as your book, Tim, Tim, we're going to talk about Tim's books, and and one of his books is called uh, "Strangers to Ourselves: The Adaptive Unconscious." That came out in about I think 2004, didn't it? Uh, a little earlier than that, but that's yeah, that's close. around there. And uh, I did not know about it when it first came out, but around the year 2007, 2008, I. Um, actually, I stumbled upon it because I was reading um, Blink by Malcolm Gladwell, and I know that you know uh, Malcolm, he, or at least he writes wonderful reviews of your books. So um, uh, I was reading his book Blink, and I was very interested in Blink and and all about unconscious processing. And I won't tell you the year I got my PhD, but let's just say it was a long time ago. So... Um, I and I had gone to um, Northeastern University for undergraduate in psychology and Penn State for graduate. And my undergraduate was all about behavioral uh, operant conditioning, Skinner, all of that. And my graduate work was all about cognitive psychology. And I really didn't get a whole lot about unconscious processing. And actually, I'll excuse myself by saying there was, I think, um, and I don't know if you agree, Tim, this this period of years where uh, if if anything was going on in in studying unconscious psychology, it wasn't making it, you know, to the top of of anyone's recognition or knowledge. Um, At least that's what I think. Is that, do you think that's true? Oh, definitely. And and, I I attribute it to the long shadow of psychoanalysis. Right. The whole Freud thing that, that we kind of, uh, psychologists, scientific psychologists kind of said forget that right yeah yeah they didn't want to be called you know gasp freudians <laughs> right and, um, even though you know i think <laughs> freud wasn't completely wrong but but nonetheless there was an attempt to that was quote unscientific yeah and so i didn't study it in graduate school so here i am decades later uh, i read blank was kind of fascinated, but felt like, you know, okay, wait a minute, I need more of the, the science behind this. And he references your book, Strangers to Ourselves, in that book. And I said, all right, well, I'm going to dig in a little deeper. So I went and read your book, which was, for me, you know, 
much more what I wanted, which was, you know, kind of the, the science behind it. And as a result of that, that just sent me off on a, I mean, I was reading all the research you were talking about in that book. And I actually, I mean, the whole field of the whole idea of the unconscious mental processing, and, um, so much of what we do and think and behave is happening unconsciously that just kind of took over my my all my work so i ended up uh applying that to technology design and writing books about it and giving speeches about it and that's a lot of <laughs> what we do so it's your fault well but, i'm humble yeah, that, that's uh that, that's a great story <laughs> i hope that was a good path for you <laughs> it was a wonderful path it was wonderful and, and a I, wonderful you know, path for all of our listeners <laughs> Well, it is. It's we can, just it's, we can, it's fascinating stuff. You can um, so so if you have all anything good to say about the podcast, please email us. Anything bad, please blame Tim. There you no. go. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. So I do though. I do want to recommend though to people listening. If you have not read the book "Strangers to Ourselves: The Adaptive Unconscious," now it's. I mean, I don't. It's not a. I have you know. I love long, ponderous academic books of which this is not um but i so i so when when i read a book that is not you know long and ponderous i always want to mention that to people because sometimes you know they think oh i don't want to read you know i don't have a phd in psychology i don't want to read that but i think your book is i mean there's a lot of research in it a lot of science in it but i also think it's very accessible um, well thank you that, that was certainly my goal to make it readable to you know pretty much anyone yeah so that was the first book you wrote. And, um, you know, when we can talk about that on, on this podcast, too, just all about unconscious processing, which on many other episodes, you know, we we talk about that in general. But then before we go off on a particular conversation, let's talk about your second book, which is called Redirect, um, which is another book I, I absolutely loved. And, and I so just so you know, I do talk about you and I talk about your books uh, and I give you full credit for, for everything uh, when I give when I give talks. So redirect um, is a is interesting and it's really different. It's not just you know more more stuff. Uh, although obviously it it calls on some of the work in your first book, but it's all about um, the power that stories have, especially self stories. In, in our behavior and the amazing, I think, amazing research of um, how uh, if you change your self story, you um, can possibly uh, make dramatic and long term changes in your behavior. Yeah, I, I think this is a really exciting time in my field, social psychology, that for years we've been kind of fiddling around in the laboratory, developing our theories and and uh, uh, mostly research with college students. But, but in the last uh, decade or so, people have taken that research out into the world and shown that it really can uh, change people's behavior in educational settings, um, many other applied settings with, with fairly minimal interventions that cause long-term change. Yeah, I mean, you talk in, your, in that book about some research on on, for instance, um, teens that are at risk. Yeah, yeah. Um, it uh, there's a lot of that. Um, there's there's um, a program, for example, that um, was designed to address teenage pregnancy. And um, you know, if we think about what might we do to help teens who are feeling alienated and are at risk for bad behavior. It might not occur to us to get them to do volunteer work, but this program called Teen Outreach did just that. As, as uh, for a year long, the, the uh, middle school and high school students committed to doing a couple hours a week of volunteer work in their community. And those that, that did so compared to a control group uh, were less likely to get pregnant um, or make someone pregnant. They got better grades. And the reason seems to be that uh, by doing the volunteer work, they changed their view of themselves, that they, they, they began to care more about their community and people in it, and as a result, felt less alienated and less likely to do things we all agree they shouldn't be doing. <laughs> 
So, so the doing the community work then changed their their story of who they were and how they fit into the community. Yeah, uh, that that's the idea. That that um, I mean, the teen. Not surprisingly, the teens who are most at risk are those who feel that they don't fit in and and feel alienated. Uh, that this is not a place for them. And, but once they became engaged in a particular community agency, as most of them did, be it a daycare center or a homeless shelter, whatever they chose to, to work in, um, they began to feel more a part of, of the community, and, and that had, had some cool benefits. Now, and, and you know, in the book, uh, Redirect, and talking about self-stories, this is not just for college students, as you mentioned, not just for teens. I mean, this is like everybody, right? We all have these self stories operating, and and what is your, you know, what is your theory or your research about why these self stories are so um, important in driving our decisions and our behavior? Well, this is a, a basic principle of of social psychology that what determines our behavior is not so much the objective environment as how we perceive that environment. So you could take two students, for example, who say two college students who both get a bad grade on their first test, and we want to predict what will happen next. Will they uh, buckle down and study harder or will they give up? And what predicts that is is their story, how they explain that to themselves, what they make of it. Um, whether they think, you know, what, what their explanation is for why they got that bad grade. And those kinds of uh, stories we tell ourselves are, are really important. We, they can become self-fulfilling or self-defeating. So the, the student who says to herself, you know, I guess this means I just can't make it here. I'm not cut out for college. That's going to lead to less effort in studying. And, and it will become true by the fact that that's what she believes. Whereas the student who decides that, no, this is just a sign that I need to buckle down and work harder, will study more, and hopefully that results in a better grade next time. So, so that story becomes self-reinforcing. And um, what's really cool is psychologists have developed these interventions to help people edit their own stories in, in beneficial ways, to, to nudge them from a bad story to a good story. So I'm... Uh... I, I'm, I guess I'm kind of an economist by profession, and I, I uh, Susan introduced me to the idea of self stories and as as a concept. Um, I don't know, a couple of years ago, and I've actually found them to be really, really powerful, because when you're looking at data sets of different individuals, um, so we can stick with the education context. Um, there are you know, there are kids who are just as smart, you know, on paper as their peers, but they have much lower uh, graduation rates in college than their peers. And that's mostly minority students. Um, and so, you know, there's there's all kinds of, you know, lots of theories about why that is. But if you if you look at uh, from a self storage perspective of someone who is a first generation uh, college person versus someone who is expected to go and finish college, their self story about that they they're a college graduate versus I'm like attending college for the first time. It's it's just a very different self story. Um, definitely, so, definitely, yeah, and, very interesting. And there's some research um, done to help um, minority and first generation students bolster that story. So they they are very prone to feeling they don't belong in these environments. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, where I teach at the University of Virginia, it's a fairly elite institution. And if you arrive here as, as a student whose parents went to college, maybe even to UVA, you have a comfort level that other students might not have. And the other students are at risk. If something happens where you feel you get have some sort of social or academic setback, uh, the student who doesn't have that that uh, good story is prone to attribute it to the fact they don't belong, um, not realizing that these kind of things happen to everyone. That we all, everyone feels they don't fit in at times. Um, and so these, there was one study done at Stanford where a one-hour intervention done in the first year of college 
uh, help minority students do better three years later, um, just by helping them edit that story a little bit and convincing them that um, everyone has adjustment problems. It's not a sign that this isn't a place for them. <laughs> yeah, and that's just and you know this that's just one tiny little idea of one little tiny thing in education. I mean, I so so I look around and I see all whenever I see all kinds of patterns and it, it's it's all it's all just self stories. Constantly. Yeah. Well, you start you know, seeing the politics world and only through corporate the culture Facebook? and yeah. and you know, the, there's products. one thing I want to be really clear about because sometimes you know we get a little pushback where someone might say, "Are are you claiming that the objective environment has no effect that that poverty, for example, is just in people's heads?" And and you know I want to be very clear that no, that's not what we're saying. That that of course we need a lot of structural change in this country and and around the world. We we need to. Uh, build homes for homeless people and and uh, make uh, more jobs for people. So so this this self story message doesn't replace the need for for environmental and structural change, but nonetheless, you know, holding those things constant, the right. particular story a person has about their situation is is very powerful. And then the other thing is that um, it, if they you know if people are growing up homeless or in poverty or in any of these other objective outside situations that is affecting the self story that they carry with them for many years so that would be the other reason to change it too yes yes so 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 um what are, are you work have you been working on the anything new and different is there anything if i've because I've, I've read both your books so if i've read both your books but i haven't talked to you recently which i haven't um, what, uh, you know, what, what could you tell us that's a kind of new research going on or what avenues are you going to be exploring next? Sure. Um, uh, you know, we have, we have lots of stuff going on and I, I think the main thing is, uh, you know, it's kind of like now for something completely different is it's really yeah. different topic and, um, you know, we got, uh, interested in the question of, why is it that so many of us are obsessed with our devices, our phones, um, uh, and unwilling to just take a moment and enjoy our own thoughts? Uh, I mean, after all, we have this big brain that's stocked full of pleasant memories and the ability to look forward to things in the future or even create imaginary worlds. Um, so given that ability, um, why don't we use it? Or why why are we so prone to... Um, want to check our email or text somebody. So we've been doing these really simple studies where we ask people to spend a short amount of time, maybe five, ten minutes, just entertaining themselves with their thoughts. Um, just take that time however, however they want. We don't tell them how to do it, just, but the goal is to, to have a pleasant experience um, by thinking. And we started this out without really a firm expectation of, of what would happen. We, we actually, I kind of thought people would might enjoy this, um, but it turned out most people <laughs> didn't. That they they found this this hard. Um, I don't mean they were pounding the walls saying, you know, let me out of here, but <laughs> but uh, but but you know, on average, it wasn't so great. And you know, our study that got the most attention was one where we gave people the opportunity to give themselves an electric shock if they wanted. Um, it occurred to us to wonder whether people <laughs> might find this so unpleasant that they prefer a negative stimulation to no stimulation. And what happened? So, um, so we did this study where this was with college students and they came in and we asked everyone if they were willing to take a sample shock to sort of see what it was like. And everyone agreed. Um, and, you know, this was... It was kind of like a severe static electricity shock. It wasn't, you know, it was painful, but not super severe. Yeah. And, and so people did this and they told us that, um, yeah, that was, you know, kind of unpleasant. And then we said to people, well, imagine we gave you $5. How much would you pay us, if anything, not to have to get another shock? And on average, people said, well, you know, a couple of bucks I think I'd give you because I don't, I don't want another shock. So then we said, okay, um, now we're going to leave you here for 15 minutes. And um, we want you to spend that time just enjoying your thoughts, however you choose to do so. And, uh, oh, by the way, the shock apparatus is still, still live. 
And, um, you know, for any have reason, fun. you wanted to shock yourself again, you could, but really, <laughs> you know, the goal is to enjoy your thoughts. And, you know, again, it's one of those studies, in fact, that, you know, my graduate students and I had some pretty big disagreements. Some of us felt, why would anyone give themselves a shock right after telling us they'd pay us $2 not to? Um, and others thought, well, you know, if you get bored enough, um, you might want to do so. Well, long story short, two-thirds of the men <laughs> and a quarter of the women shocked themselves at least once. And, um, you know, the gender difference we're not too sure about. We, we generally don't find gender differences in these studies. Uh, um, there's some evidence men are more sensation-seeking. But, but I think the, you know, I think the bottom line is that it's hard to deliberately uh, maintain a pleasurable stream of thought that, it, yes, we all enjoy letting our minds wander sometimes, but to have this goal of enjoy yourself is difficult. And the alternative of a little shock is appealing to some people and, and uh, as an alternative. Now, we've made some progress in making this easier for people because I, I remain convinced that this should be a tool in our mental toolbox, that we should have this ability to at least spend a few minutes enjoying our thoughts. And we could use that and at times when um, you know, we would otherwise go to our devices or when we're trying to fall asleep or stuck at a traffic light. And, and we have made some progress in making it easier and more enjoyable for people. But, um, but for, as for the most part, absent that, most people don't enjoy it very much. <laughs> so in my own personal experience, I actually, I'm one of the rare ones. Uh, I know a ton of people, especially my age. Uh, I went to law school, so especially in law school, um, who have trouble sleeping. Just uh -huh. uh, everyone I kn know just can't fall asleep unless there's something going on. Um, I'm one of the lucky ones. I can, as long as I can lie flat, I, I, could, I can fall asleep just fine. I've never had any problems. I get my eight and a half hours a night. It's great. Um, but I can certainly attest if I, if, if I had to do that, I would probably shock myself once or twice. <laughs> Um, just, just because, but I find, uh, so a couple, couple different things. First, I find that's one of the reasons I like doing kind of brainless physical activity, especially if I've been doing like a lot of like intense law school thinking or, or any kind of, you know, very, very, not very intense, but at least intellectual. So that's the classic, like George, um, George Bush, like going to the ranch and clearing brush, <laughs> Uh, or, you know, my dad chopping trees or something, you know, you know, so, something, uh, it's, it's just like a physical activity. So you're, you're keeping preoccupied. It's not like you're just alone with your thoughts and worrying about the day or trying to figure out what you should do about health insurance or something. Um, but it's still kind of a brainless, you can just kind of let your mind wander uh -huh. situation. Um, and that's the other, the other reason is like, I, whenever I'm doing anything in my house, I always have a podcast on. Uh, when I'm at the gym, I have a podcast yeah. on. When I'm washing dishes, I'm when I'm walking around, I have a you know podcast on. So you have a constant stimulation. So I have a constant stimulation, yeah. Except when I go to sleep, then I um I I have in my I can basically tell a story to myself. Usually, I'm a superhero, um, saving the world, superpowers. Uh, generally telekinetic, but sometimes you know I can make fireballs with my hands, uh, or I'm playing basketball with famous people. Um, that's how you go to sleep at night basically and then that kind of just becomes my dream so um well, you know that's interesting because i have certain stock stories i re you know i resort to if i can't sleep and you know some involve sports um some involve you know i I'm, I, I try to get a very detailed imagery of hiking in a certain place oh, that nice. i and, and um and to me you know i usually don't have that much trouble falling asleep so i don't have to do it for very long but but um uh, it does help to have topics, sort of uh, stock topics to return to, I find. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I've never tried that. When, um, when I was younger, I had one where I was a, uh, a basil baron. Basil I, as in the herb? As in the herb. I, was, I, I, would, I had like this farmland and I just like exclusively grew basil. But then there was like <laughs> some sort of research that came out that like basil was like crazy healthy for you. And it just became 
like essentially the new kale before kale was kale because this was a number of years ago so like they replaced all of the lettuce with basil for hmm. everything and then i became like this quadrillionaire and and like took over like made a farming empire and then did you finally fall asleep no this and this was like a running story that i did for like a couple years now would you imagine it at a very detailed level of you you're planting the basil you're you're tending you're pulling the weeds or is it more sort of a general wow i'm rich uh, um oh oh quite yeah it would it would be kind of like a you know chapter by chapter so i wouldn't be doing i was i was definitely the business person uh -huh. um i would be doing the actual like you know like walking through the fields but then kind of like making big investments and stuff uh -huh. yeah no i don't in my dreams, for the most part, I'm the hero, or I I don't do I don't, I'm not picking. You don't do manual labor. You de you delegate. Yeah. It's not beneath me. <laughs> but are I mean, you just busy doing the business end? Yeah, you're the brains behind it. I yeah. mean, if you had telekinetic powers, would how would how much weeding <laughs> would you do? <laughs> um, yeah. Now, now, Tim, do you wear glasses? I do. And Susan, I know you do. Yeah. And I also do. So when I fall asleep, um, generally or in my mind's vision, things are kind of blurry for the most part. Because you don't have your glasses on? Something like that. Though there have been times, I remember very specifically, where I had um, like a, a, a lucid dream, I think that's the phrase. Uh -huh. um, that was like an HD. It was like crazy high resolution, way higher than my normal thoughts are. So I, I specifically remember having that and being like, oh, wow, this is crazy. But normally, um, my my kind of mind's eye is at a pretty low resolution, a little blurry. You know, dream, dreams are fascinating in, in many ways. But but one is that obviously we are the author of the dream. I mean, we are no one but us who is sure. making up the story. But we experience it as the actors. We don't we don't experience the script writing. We are just acting it not knowing that part of our mind behind the scenes is directing the action and writing the script. And I think that's one reason it's harder to do when we're awake is, is that you have to kind of simultaneously script write and, yeah. um, and experience. And that, that makes it more difficult. It makes perfect sense. I had a dream again recently that I remember where I was, um, uh, I was in an improv comedy situation and uh, I did this really funny bit with a guy on stage, right? But but I was doing it with myself, <laughs> right? Like, you know, it was my dream. I was just doing the bit with myself. But if I was completely awake, it wouldn't be funny. There would be no, like, give and take. It right. wouldn't work. Right. Uh, wow, that's... All right, I'm, I'm going to take us back because you guys have got... I mean, t talk about Freudian analysis here. We could do dream analysis here. Basically. But I but I want to go back to the research with, uh, with the shocking themselves because that's well, interesting. I'll tie, yeah, I'll tie it together. I would okay. be very... I, I, I like external stimulus. So um, you would be shocking yourself. I have, on purpose, I was at a party... Uh, where there was a taser and we all took turns tasing each other just to see what it was like. And this wasn't like a little, this was like a, like a large rape, like anti-rape taser. So. So it was painful. I think I would do that. Yeah. It was kind of cool. I would not do this. So maybe this is a, <laughs> maybe this is a gender difference here. Now, and I was going to ask you, but Tim said he would do it. And I don't think he's in the same generation as you, Guthrie. So, I mean, I was going to ask Guthrie because I know you, you and I talk a lot about generational differences, whether yeah. you thought, you know, this was a generational thing, whether you thought mm. either that young people in general uh, crave more stimulation than older people or whether you thought that the millennials, this particular cohort, perhaps crave more stimulation than other cohorts. I don't know. Tim actually might have some numbers on that. I mean, generally, it's, you know, young people seem to have... A lower I mean they call it an attention span but really I think what it is is just a lower tolerance for sitting still with your thoughts um, yeah I mean the the only numbers I have we don't have this with shocks but we do have quite a number of people of different ages who just tell us how much they enjoy being alone with their thoughts 
And we find a small correlation with age such that older people enjoy it more than younger people. Mm. It's, it's not traumatic. Um, there's plenty of variation at all ages, but, but there is a slight trend in that direction. Mm. Um, and, and as far as actually getting shocked, I, I, I think there's a certain, I am actually, I should say, I'm not much of a thrill seeker. Um, I like doing exciting things, but I'm not an adrenaline junkie. I mean, I have friends who love roller coasters and want to jump out of airplanes and, you know, climb on, uh, you know, like do watch horror movies. I'm not much of that kind of a person, um, just personally. So I guess it's strange that I would probably want to shock myself because you would, you, you would think that there'd be like some sort of correlation between those who would like, like to take, you know, do, you know, roller coasters and horror movies and those that would want to shock themselves, mm. but I don't know. Guthrie, are you a meditator by any chance? Have you, have you tried meditation? Uh, yeah, I used to meditate rather frequently. I don't so much anymore, but yes. Yeah, and I, because Tim, I was going to ask about this. I, I do mindfulness meditation, and um, I actually am teaching a mindfulness meditation course in September. Um, and I, and so for instance, I was, um, I was an expert witness for the FTC a couple of years ago and I was, um, waiting to, uh, you know, go in front of the judge and they put us in this tiny room. I was there with like three other people and we, and we had to sit there and not talk to anyone we weren't even supposed to talk to each other, and we certainly couldn't talk to anyone outside of that room. And we were in there for um, approximately seven hours. Wow. Uh, we could go out, and they gave us little breaks to go to the restroom, and that was it. And uh, they brought us some food. And we to get in the building, um, you couldn't bring in any devices, anything. You couldn't bring in computer, no cell phone, no nothing, right? They should have had some shock apparatus. In there. <laughs> so, and they had like a newspaper, you know, uh, in the room, and that was it. Now, I did have with me uh, a pen and pencil, um, but I, I was, and I, you know, and we didn't know how long we were going to be in there, right? I mean, we could be all day, or it could be an hour, and we had no idea. And uh, I, you know, I knew that this was, you know, I knew I couldn't bring any devices with me. Um, and I'm one of these people, I mean, maybe everybody is. I mean, the, to me, one of the worst things, and I remember this as a child in school, one of the worst things is being bored. I mean, that's just like painful. It's physically painful to me. And also we're in this tiny room where you can't even like pace much, you know, like you can't do anything physical except sit there or stand up and pace like a few feet either way. And, uh, I was kind of curious, you know, I'm like watching my own behavior, right? And I was kind of curious how I was going to react to this. And um, so I did end up meditating for a while. And uh, then I ended up just doing, you know, free form, you know, not meditating, but letting my imagination go. But eventually I got out the paper and pen <laughs> and I was making extensive like to do lists and uh, you know, business planning for the future, you know, uh, just anything to get my mind engaged on something in particular. Yeah, I don't meditate a whole lot, but I, if I need to, I will. So like at a dentist office, if I'm getting my <laughs> teeth cleaned, right? And I don't want to just yeah, sit there and focus on it. That's when I meditate. Well, I mean, one, re one reason I ask is because it, this is certainly an alternative to the kind of thought I've been discussing. And instead of trying to fill up our minds with pleasant thoughts, meditating, at least some forms of meditation are emptying the mind and noticing thoughts, but not dwelling on them. Right. Um, but it's not something I've, I, I've been particularly successful at. I mean, there is, as I'm sure you know, um, a lot of research saying it's, it's a very beneficial practice and has all sorts of uh, uh, emotional and cognitive benefits. Um, but I think, I mean, that, that was one of the inspirations for my research as well. Um, why do we have to empty the mind when we also could just fill it up? And, and mm. um, you know, I think one answer is it's hard to fill it up for a sustained period of time. <laughs> uh, and maybe, you know, maybe because you say you don't have trouble falling asleep. It's possible that I so like me personally, 
I don't meditate a whole lot um, anymore, but I feel like I don't need to. I am the type of person who I kind of live on the moment of my thoughts and stuff doesn't uh, really like stick with me. It doesn't gnaw at me. It's not like I can't get things out of my head. Um, I, you know, I, I'm yeah, closer yeah. on the puppy spectrum where I'm like, oh, this is exciting. Oh, I'm going to cook now, you know, um, and I, it's not like I have things eating away at me. Um, but I certainly know uh, people who do uh, yeah. and they, they just can't, you know, stop thinking about the mistake they made or the this they made. And and so I could certainly see how, you know, if, if you were had mm-hmm. trouble doing that, maybe you have more trouble falling asleep because, um, again, it's it's easy for me. My mind's always empty. <laughs> yeah that's interesting so then i i but i think that were you implying tim that one of the reasons that we get so easily um attached to you know our devices and our technology and our cell phone is that it prevents us from ever having to you know from ever being in the place where we have nothing to do and nothing to think about so no stimulation yeah, and, and um, we have a little bit of data suggesting that people, um, they're sort of guilty pleasures, that we, we think it'll be enjoyable to do those things, but we don't find them particularly worthwhile. Wait a minute, which ones? We think uh, it'd be enjoyable to do what? Um, our devices, our, our okay. you know, texting somebody, um, uh, playing a game on our phone, whatever. Um, and we don't have much confidence that we could just spend that same time enjoying our thoughts. But I, but I think, yes, that's true to a certain extent. But again, we, we've had a little luck uh, finding ways of getting people to enjoy it more, um, mostly by having people kind of prepare their topics and reminding them of those topics as, as they're thinking. And, and so I think it's an ability that with a little practice, uh, maybe having some of those stock stories like you and I do, Guthrie, that, that people would learn that this is an alternative to playing Candy Crush or Pokemon Go or something, and, and it might actually be more worthwhile. <laughs> so um, shouldn't we create an app for this? Well, it's funny you say that because, you know, we're, we're doing a study now where we, um, we're, we're asking people to do this in their daily lives, and we thought of developing an app, but we, we decided against it because the last thing we wanted them to do is have their phone in front of them. <laughs> <laughs> what, and, what about an app that was like on paper? Well, that's your, your great minds think alike. Cause that's, <laughs> cause we, what, is uh, it, what is an app that's on paper? What does that mean? Well, what we ended up doing is just being very retro and having giving people index cards in which they wrote down topics they would enjoy thinking about. And these are connected with a metal ring, and we ask them to carry them around with them during the day. And and when they have a few moments of downtime, to just take out those cards and flip through them and find a topic they would enjoy thinking about. And uh, this is, you know, the study's ongoing, so I can't tell you the results, but we're comparing that group to others who are asked, instead of trying to have pleasant thoughts, to spend that same time planning out their next couple of days or a group that just does whatever they would normally do, such as consult their phones. And so we'll see whether there is any benefit to doing this in one's everyday life. So what, and what, what's your measurement going to be? Uh, we um, asked them after each episode, we just asked them to evaluate what, you know, how bored they were, how meaningful it was. And, and then at the end of the day, they fill out a survey where they, they tell us how they're feeling and, and how worthwhile these activities were, that sort of thing. Um, so the original app that was on paper, I don't know if you guys had this when you were in school, but like in third grade, you could take a little piece of paper and you fold it in a certain way. So it's, it almost makes like like a toucan beak, but there's four of them and they kind of pinch together and then you can oh, yeah. open one way. And then depending on like how, like so if someone gives a word and then you do the number of letters in that word, like, together and then like up wide up wide you yeah, know yeah. and then and then you pick a certain like leaf yeah and then that leaf has a has like an action so you're saying that you could do you could but but you'd have to do this with yourself right you can do it with yourself and that way so you're saying rather than index cards use what what is that called 
What are those things called? I, I, I'm, there is a name for it. I'm trying to think. I can't come up with it. So I'm just uh, saying that there there have been at, basically app, what what paper, is an app? app but the equivalent you can, of a paper the, app. The equivalent of a paper. App. <laughs> That's um. Yeah, I've, I'll be, Tim, well, I'm going to have to follow up with you on this because I really, I'm very interested in in uh, what the result is of the research and, and what you find and whether people enjoyed, um, you know, coming up with the, their own stories. You know, and I'm wondering, Guthrie, you know, you and I talk sometimes about, you know, future technology. And I could... So I don't know if this qualifies as using a device or not, but if you, you know, if we ever get to the point where we've got impl things implanted in us, you could maybe, you know, have some of these story ideas and you could flip through them and then say, okay, that there, I'll think about that one. And it would remind you to, about some of your stories. Um, that, uh, I believe what you're talking about is a contact lens that displays an image on it. And I know, that might work. Yeah, yeah, but the problem is is that then everyone will just be watching porn all the time. <laughs> no, no, no. That, but yes, are... they will. That's that if you have a contact lens that displays images only you can see. I, I was thinking more of Basil King or Basil King. Sure, that might happen a little bit. I'm just I'm just telling you. Given the propensity of people, all right, you're right. We can't have any. Porn on any all right, device how about, they can get their how hands about if on. we don't? Ha well, then I don't want to do the contact lens with the image. <laughs> how about if we just have words that appear in your brain? You know, with ba basil. Can, yeah, but if you can make a word appear, you can play a movie. All right, forget it. Then we'll just do it. Then we'll do non-electronic versions. <laughs> paper, she says. I want paper. Bob, well, I like. Why we're sticking with paper and pen. So, um. Tim, are you? Do you have any other books in mind coming up? Does anyone convince you to write another book? Uh, you know, there are some things percolating, but nothing in progress. Uh, there were ten years between my first two books, and so, um, you know, I, I'm not churning one out every year. But quality over quantity. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Tim, is there anything else that you'd like to uh, promote? Um. I don't think so. I mean, other than to you know go back to our discussion of of these interventions that I talk about and redirect that that uh, I really do think it's an exciting time in in research psychology to to show how real behavior in the real world that we all care about can be changed with um, fairly minimal interventions if we do them right and catch people at the right time and and so it, i'm I'm very uh, bullish on on our field at, at this point. Yeah, and I do, I, I'll echo that. I mean, if you have, for people listening, if you have not read the book, Redirect, you, you really should read it. It's so impressive how these these really short and inexpensive things, right? Like watching a video um, could have these long-term critical uh, effects on behavior. Uh, it's it's eye opening, and I I love the research in there too, Tim. Um, be about because uh, you had some that had to do with, for instance, people who have uh, post traumatic stress disorder, and and just how important it is to put science behind the interventions that we do. Because I think yes. we have a tendency to come up with an intervention that sounds like it would be a good idea, but you know the science would. Tell, tell tells us otherwise yes yes definitely all right so the two books i'll summarize here um two books by uh dr wilson that um uh, we're recommending strangers to ourselves and redirect and those are both available wherever you buy books and um thanks so much for coming on like i said it's a, it's I'm, I'm a little bit of starstruck fan here <laughs> Uh, I, and it's uh, so exciting to have you on and we will get in touch with you a little later and see if you have a, any follow up to the um, people shocking themselves or uh, you know coming up with the uh, um, imagination instead of something else uh, that research well thanks Susan and Guthrie for inviting me I enjoyed it 
Wonderful. Um, and so if you have any questions uh, or, uh, or comments, anything, you could email us again, info at theteamw.com. Uh, Susan, what's your Twitter handle? At the brain lady. So you can yell at her if you want uh, on, on Twitter. Uh, all of our information is at theteamw.com. And of course, you can uh, check out all of our courses at courses.theteamw.com. Uh, I am Guthrie. Uh, thank you again, Tim, for coming on. My and, pleasure. Yeah, and uh, Susan, thank you as well. No problem. And uh, we will all uh, talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.